This week, we are talking about a very special topic that I know you are going to really shine at because it is the magic of color deficiency. Did you use the word special on purpose? Uncomfortable pause. pause. (laughs) This is going to be such a fun conversation. I can't wait. Light from Lantern presents. Knit a spell. I'm magical maker, Katie Rempe. And I'm the maker of magic, James Devine. Join us as we stitch together the symbiotic relationship between crafting and the craft. Let's dive in. So this is a topic that as this whole season has been the magic of color, not everyone sees color exactly the same. So I wanted to be sure to talk about this and who better to be our resident expert than the man himself, our very own magical maker, James Devine. Woo! James well, Devine, the colorblind. Ooh, that's right. But he'll still see you coming. So don't worry. Yeah, watch out. I'm curious to know, and I'm sure many listeners are too, does the fact that you're, quote, color deficient, color blind, make color magic less powerful for you? Or does it actually take on a whole new life? It's funny, like, when people are colorblind, they often don't know it. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. It's one of those things that it doesn't really bother us often. It's one of those things that I think sometimes affects other people more. Because it's other people that might say, your outfit doesn't match, or why are you wearing those colors together, or Mm. whatever. That doesn't happen with me, because... Because you're amazing. Because I have style. style. Yes. (laughs) I have one green shirt in my closet, and I think I have two red shirts. And everything else goes with everything else. So... I just know that and I have to remember which shirts they are. So Mm. that's one of the hacks that I have in my closet. So FYI. But if I didn't care, then Mm. it would be DGAF. I just would not give a F. So yeah, the question is, does it lessen the power of color magic? So we often don't know that we're colorblind or we don't really like it doesn't bother us. It's because I have been teased as a little kid, Mm. like Jimmy got his colors wrong or Jimmy thinks blue is purple or purple is blue or Jimmy colored the trunk of the tree green when it's supposed to be brown. So that's really where the desire to get the colors, quote unquote, right is ingrained in me. So that's, I think, part of where this comes from. But the power of color magic, when I can let that go... I can just let myself experience the beauty of the colors just like anyone else. The rainbow of fruit flavor of colors is gorgeous and beautiful. And I experience it completely and have joy and goosebumps and experience that. I see a rainbow and I'm like, oh my God, it's so pretty. Mm. Or I see the colors, the gorgeous sunset. And I'm like, gosh, that sunset is beautiful. Just like everyone else. I in no way experience the word deficiency. Such a great example of what you believe is your reality. What you see is what is there. Like you said, if you don't know that you're seeing it any differently, then who cares? Yeah. One person that I know who is colorblind and he's out about it is our good friend who writes all about crystals. Oh, yes, that's right. Nicholas Pearson. Nicholas Pearson. Oh, and I asked him recently, we were at a conference and I said, Nicholas, you and I are both colorblind. We totally bonded on it. And I'm like, but you have to identify rocks. And he said, color is the last thing you look at. Yeah. Because a rock must be identified in many other ways besides color. And mm. I really appreciated that so much. When we look at a rock, most people are looking at color. But if you're a true gemologist, a true mineralogist, someone who's really looking at rocks, take it from Nicholas, color is the last thing. Because if you even think about peridot, which Mm. we often think about as green, gee, that can come in a ton of different shades of green and even colors that are not green. And this is true of many minerals and many gems. That's really not the thing that is the most identifiable. 
for us yeah. as lay people, we're looking for that purple amethyst. But for him as a gemologist, he's looking for what are those other things that help him identify the rock? So I think to answer your question, being colorblind, having color deficiency, being blessed with a different way of seeing colors does not lessen the power of color magic. It does help color magic take on a new life for me. Mm -hmm. And it makes it different than how other people see colors, which I have learned to relish and find fascinating. As a child, especially in school, we're all socialized to follow the grain and you know, get everything right and, yep, don't stand out. And it's not until really we become adults, I think, that most of us, maybe not everybody, but most of us gain that self-confidence to just be like, this is what it is and it's too exhausting to try to put on airs or whatever. But something you said made me wonder, and I never really even thought about this, but are there people out there who are colorblind that are trying to keep it under wraps that are in, in, no, they are, but are like, oh, I can't tell anyone about this. Yep. And like, why would that be? Because they're in a job where they're not allowed to be colorblind. So if there are oh. people who have gotten into the military or in military positions or into medical positions or other positions, even though they are colorblind to some degree, either because it may be mild and they may not realize or because they were ushered in. I've heard stories of people being let in because they knew somebody or whatever, mm -hmm. and then they had to keep their colorblindness under wraps. So we have ways of figuring it out. One of the hardest things to distinguish for me are LED lights. When you see a green LED indicator versus a red LED indicator versus a yellow LED indicator, those are very hard to distinguish, mm -hmm. especially ones that were manufactured much earlier than the present day ones. So if you're flying a Boeing jet manufactured in any time earlier than now, which yeah. are most of the jets, most of the airplanes that are in the air, those little LED indicators that might flash red or that might just be red mm. uh, when they're green they're going to look the same color. So you're not going to see a red indicator light, which could indicate a problem. Fortunately, jets have redundant systems or they have alarms or they have other things. But these are issues that is why pilots aren't allowed to be colorblind, <laughs> right? I guess that makes sense when you think about it. Okay, yep. yeah. Even if all the lights are typically on the red or the right that are red or something like that, you never know. So yeah, you want to be able to easily scan the control panel and see it at a glance that something is red versus amber or green. Yeah. So the same in medicine. I, mean, I don't know if there's a restriction against that, against physicians being colorblind, but mm -hmm. that can be very helpful in surgery or electricians when they're doing electrical <laughs> wires are labeled often with letters now, as well as colors. But in the old days, it was just the colored wires hmm. and without other labels or other indicators. So it was challenging for people in different jobs. And in the military, that's something that they test for. And they're looking for people that have high levels of color perception because you can't label landscapes or other things. You have to be able to have color perception. Now, I will say there are colorblind people that do have roles in the military because some people that have colorblindness can perceive things that color perceptive people cannot. Like we can perceive value differences a little bit differently and movement a little better and so other things. So there are specialized roles for people that have color deficiency that can be uh, very helpful. That is something we'll get to as well is like, it really has benefits if you're willing to look at them that way. So could you share with us how would somebody realize that they were, or how did you realize you were colorblind? Oh, my dad's colorblind. Oh, um, okay. Is it so one in the family? It can. Yeah, it's genetic. Okay. Um, and the, the type of colorblindness I have is called deutranopoly or deutranopia, and it's more of a green blindness. So I have more of a deficiency in the cones and in the perception of green. It's a green-red colorblindness, and there's all these people that have a red-green colorblindness where they have more of a issue seeing red. But 
Mm. Basically, I have a hard time seeing green and red. So my world is basically blue and yellow is Mm. what I see the best. Thus, my background in the YouTube that you may be watching. Ah, right. (laughs) Blue and yellow. You'll mostly see me in black, white, blue, and yellow. Or mostly blue, because yellow is a wonderful color, but it is not my favorite. You'll see me in purple. That's mostly because it's a very interesting color of blue. And we talked about the episode on purple. It's fun to hear me talk about a color that I may not fully perceive, but still I somehow perceive it. So how did you learn that you were colorblind? So my dad's colorblind. Colorblindness runs in families. It's often in males, especially for red-green colorblindness. So there was already some familiarity with what colorblindness is and how it presents. So as a little kid, it was evident because I would say things or I would see things or I'd grab things. And mom had an idea even when I was very little. So when I came home from first or second grade with a note pinned to me that the nurse gave me a colorblind test and determined that I was colorblind, mom looked at the note and was like, yeah, no kidding. (laughs) I, I had a thought. And there was things that I would say, mom, why do they make fire engines red? And she'd say, so we can see them really easily. And I'm like, If they want us to see them really easily, why don't they make them blue? (laughs) Mm, Yeah, okay. Yeah, what? what? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Then they'd really pop out. There's not a lot of blue things. Wow. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so for you, it was pretty obvious. And so everyone was able to help make you comfortable with it or at least bring awareness to it, which I guess it didn't really matter anyway because you were still living your life. No one did anything. Oh, (laughs) There's nothing to do. The world is as the world is. There was no colorblind glasses at the time. There was nothing. It's whatever. And it doesn't hurt anything. It's just. You just know. Yeah. Yeah. So Jimmy's colorblind, whatever. And then Mm -hmm. when I color things in class, I'm always going to color them wrong. And eventually in art class, I embraced it because enough of the times I would do things wrong and feel like really bad about it Mm. until my art instructor, my painting instructor was like, don't you dare correct that. That's amazing. Yeah. And that was really the permission I needed to say, oh, embrace this. I started ignoring colors completely and just started using the colors as value. And I rearranged my palette and all my paints based on their value rather than their color. So the lightest colors were at the top and the darkest colors were at the bottom. And then I just painted based on light to dark. And my painting started to just really be amazing. When I started doing that, the number one thing that people would say about my paintings, you have an amazing sense of color. Wow, your color work is incredible. Wow, you're so good with color. And I would just laugh. So my (laughs) advice to all the yarn color pickers The yarn color consternators out there. Yes. If you're a yarn color consternator, give it up. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just go with your bliss. If you can't decide, then do that piece in eight colors. Go to the remnant section. Do it in that. Totally. And I always used to tell people who would be so worried about that. I'd say, well, you picked these colors initially. So I'm guessing you like them enough to have them in your hand. What's the worst yeah. it could be? <laughs> Knit it with what you like. Yeah. Or yeah. get the ones that have multiple colors in them. If I was knitting, every piece I would knit with would be yarns with multiple colors. They would either be those ones that have the variegation in the dyes, or mm. they would be the ones that have all those little like oh. glitter and crap parted yeah. into it. It would never be a solid yarn for me. And I would just be like, okay, and how many of these can I use? (laughs) I'll tell you what, one day we're going to have on Stephen West and you two are just going to go bananas talking about color. It's going to be great. Stephen West stuff is so cool. And yeah, I would just do like ombres from whatever's light to whatever's dark and who cares what color. Totally. Yeah. So fun. Why not paint with yarn? Think of your piece as a painting. That would be so cool. Your needles are like the paintbrush, essentially, and the yarn is the paint. I love it. 
as a magical maker and maker of magic who has colors that they don't care about seeing, as you said in your clothes, you don't really wear them, but what about specifically when it comes to magic, like picking colors to work magic? Do you find that you don't use red or green much there either? I will use the colors that are appropriate for a spell. I will sometimes ask. So I'll go to Richard and say, is this a green candle or a brown candle? Mm. And he'll say, that's a tan candle. (laughs) And I'm like, dang. He'll actually usually say, oh, that's a red candle. And he'll laugh. He (laughs) thinks it's so cute. He has a great story of a time when we had a group of friends who would play cards every week. Mm. And so we would get together for card night. And to demonstrate my colorblindness, which he always has been fascinated with, he was like, okay, here, I'll show you guys what I mean. There were these candies I think we were eating. And so he picked up a whole group of like the red and the green ones. And he put them in a pile on the table. It's okay, Jim, separate out the two colors. And so I looked at the pile and I was like, immediately started to separate them out. And I was so focused. I didn't see everyone else's jaw had dropped to the floor. And I was earnestly concentrating, separating them out. It was really difficult, but I could tell that some were darker and some were lighter. So eventually I got them all separated and I looked up and everyone was just flabbergasted. They were all the same color. (laughs) What a jerk! (laughs) (laughs) But everyone could tell that they were the same color (laughs) immediately but it was an interesting experiment that like i immediately Mm. couldn't tell that they were all the same but you could immediately tell they're all a pile of the same color of candy but one of the interesting things was also that i could see the subtle differences that they were maybe from a different lot Mm. there was a difference in how thick the candy coating was over the gel on the inside or whatever that there were some that were slightly darker and slightly lighter. So really you made a pile of slightly darker than the other like M&Ms or something. Right, or Mike and Ike's (laughs) or whatever they were, yeah. Yeah. Those M's were W's the whole time, yeah. (laughs) I separated the M's from the W's for sure. (laughs) Hopefully you find ways to get back at Richard for using you as (laughs) the entertainment. (laughs) Don't worry, we had lots of fun during card night. (laughs) There was another instance way back with my previous boyfriend where we're sitting on the bed and we're just folding laundry together and our friend Gail comes over. Gail is so much fun. She is hilarious. And we're folding laundry and there are these like, um, you know, those socks that have two colors. Mm -hmm. It's hard to tell what color they are, not for you, but anyway, so I'm matching socks because I'm just folding the socks and (laughs) we're talking. Gail's kind of sitting on the bed with us. And then she picks up a pair of socks and she throws them at Rusty's head and it bounces off his head. And she just yells at him because she knows I'm colorblind. We all do. And she goes, you're letting him match socks. (laughs) (laughs) What are you doing? (laughs) Like it's like it's some horrible thing. (laughs) It was so hilarious. Oh, my gosh. No ends of fun with me. Oh, I'll tell you Mm -hmm. what. Always something new. Always something new. All right, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll have you share some tips and tricks with our listeners. Yay. We'll be right back. Hey, Magical Makers. We may be rolling down our last month of this season, but the Knit a Spell Patreon is open all year. For $5 a month, you can support one of your favorite podcasts while also getting news about behind-the-scenes happenings. And after three months, you'll get a free Knit a Spell sticker sent right to your door. To join us and learn more, visit patreon.com forward slash knit a spell. Hope to see you there. As we roll into the holiday season, remember the gift that never gets delayed in the mail. That's right, it's the gift of a divine hand palm reading or tarot reading. Whether you're gifting it to yourself or a loved one who's been waiting for an opportunity to get a reading from Jim, now is the time to make all of their dreams come true. Just visit thedivinehand.com to sign up and learn more. And we're back! 
Jim, for those who are fellow color deficient folk, what are some tips that you can share uh, about working with the spectrum that they can see? I thought it was going to be the other way. We already know what to do. I don't need to give advice to colorblind people. Oh. Because we are like, we're good. Colorblind right. people got to figure it out. We already know how to work with colors. We've lived with this our whole life. The people who need advice are the color seeing people. You're so right. Yeah, because how do the color seeing people mm. help make the world a little easier for the people who see color differently? Yes. That's the question that I think is the most helpful. What are things that you don't think about? One of the things is, and we've talked about this before, naming colors. So if you name a color storm, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's gray or blue or gray purple or aqua green or what the hell color it is. Yeah. Sure. So naming it storm gray, stormy blue, stormy purple, that is essential. And mm. I know you yourself made that mistake one time. Oh yeah. I had learning opportunities and yeah. that. Yes, absolutely. And so that's one of the things that makes the world a little more accessible and actually will make your things that have colors with them sell better. I just ran up against that at a yarn shop recently where there were names that didn't describe what color it was because the person who named it was like, obviously you can see that this is a tan or you can mm -hmm. tell this is a light green. And I'm like, I can't tell that from yellow girl. Come on. Sometimes I do care about the color for reasons. And although I just said in the first half, I can live not caring about color. There are times when I am doing something intentional and I do want it to have a certain vibration. And I do care about the color because we are in a world where there are a lot of other people that do care about color mm -hmm. and color does have meaning. So mm -hmm. that's important. If you're giving a presentation or you're making signs or you're doing something that needs to communicate, you're color coding things. Think about color coding with something in addition to color. You can put a G on top of green, an R on top of red. You can make it with a shape. You can use something in addition to just the color to indicate what it is, a small pattern on top of that, in addition to the color would make that more accessible. The other thing you can do is, since most people are red-green colorblind, you can make the green to the blue spectrum and you can make the red to the orangey oh. side. I mean, you can make the yellow really pure yellow or make the red kind of a darker red. That'll separate them enough so that we can tell like the stoplights that the green is green and the red is red and the yellow is light and it's yellow. So that's another way to distinguish those from each other for people with the most common form of red, green color blindness. But these are some of the tips that are pretty common for color seeing folks mm. to help make the world a little more accessible to the color blind folks. That is so smart. Great tips. And I know we have a link that we'll include in the show notes to a Wikipedia article that has lots and lots of great examples of this, including one that was a stoplight that used shapes along with colors yeah. in the uh, layout of it, which again, I would never have even thought of, but even as right. a quote color seeing person, I think that's more exciting to look at. Oh, it's shapes and colors. We can take in more than one piece of information at once. <laughs> yeah. I do think that what I would say to my colorblind siblings mm. is fully embrace your colorblindness as a gift. It is so not a disability. It is mm -hmm. an amazing gift of being able to see the world in a whole new way. One of the magical things that I do is shifting my perception we are told that we don't see pink or that we see pink as gray. And so what I've started to do is if the color of bubblegum and the color of the sidewalks is the same, then it's really easy to shift my perception and see the sidewalks as pink. Mm -hmm. So bubblegum sidewalks. If the color lavender, which is associated with 
that amazing scent of lavender and all the healing properties of lavender and the color of light blue are the same, then I can walk under lavender skies. Mm. And so having this idea of like, okay, great. Bubblegum sidewalks and lavender skies. Maybe that will be the title of my memoir one day. <laughs> Heck yeah. Because that sort of describes like what I'm able to shift in my world. And that's an amazing ability. Mm. So that's something that I challenge other people with red, green colorblindness to try and do as a meditative technique, as a perceptive technique. And I challenge color seeing people like, can you shift gray? And what if you saw gray to have a little bit of pink in it? Because you know how that certain color gray and that certain color pink are the same color, except that one has a little bit of reddish tint. If you were to just add some of the light red mm -hmm. to that light gray, it would be pink. Totally. Like, yeah. Or if, re if you replace the gray with red, it would just be pink. Can you do that in your mind's eye? Can you see it as pink for a second and not be distracted by the color? It would be harder for a color seeing person, but to be able to master that would be, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, that would be an amazing ability to shift your perception. We've talked about this in the past, probably when we talked about gray magic, which we'll link in the show notes. I remember when you first told me about this, I was like, wait, what? And I thought about it a lot and I would find myself walking the dog on the sidewalk and I'm looking down at the dog and I'm looking at the sidewalk. And if you don't pay attention too much to the fact that you're like, it's a gray sidewalk and you're just doing that like magic eye looking, but not really looking kind of a thing that lim liminal, almost daydream type state. Yeah. Absolutely. You can look and start thinking like, am I walking on bubble tape? Yes. I'm starting to see a little bit of that. And I don't know if it's because my eyes have been open for so long and they're like starting to play tricks on me a little bit or whatever, but what's the difference right now? When I see that light gray, I have to look twice just to make sure what I'm looking at is that and not something that I'm like letting my mind run wild with. So yeah. It's definitely possible, but you're right. It's not easy. Yeah. Letting your mind run wild. What's the root of magic? Imagination, mm -hmm. visualization. If you're able to visualize something, pink sidewalks, now you have the key to a whole new world of visualization for magic. And it's scary. If you're really able to start doing it, you start to question, will I be able to actually accurately see color when I'm helping someone match color? When I have my degree in fashion design mm -hmm. and this is part of my identity. And now my identity is slipping away because I'm seeing a gray sidewalk as a roll of bubble tape. Wait, no. And you might then grip back to quote unquote reality. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, yes, you can always come back to reality. The acid trip can stop whenever you want it to, <laughs> but allowing yourself to release into that vision and be at cause in that, mm -hmm. this is the foundation of magic. And this is how we manifest uh, the reality that we choose. So this is why this is such a powerful opportunity. And one of the ways, this is any way that we can really visualize and start to see something. So this is an exercise brought to you by The Colorblind. <laughs> And notice where you get freaked out and you're like, oh my God, I'm losing my grip on reality. Yeah. And then you'll snap you, right back. <laughs> yeah, you'll snap right back. And then you can start to do that. You can start to visualize that you are lovable. You can start to visualize yourself as beautiful and start mm -hmm. to see your beauty as you are in the mirror. You can start to visualize your success. And these are things that are real and are mm -hmm. true. And this is how we create magic. And even though our ego is always right there, ready to be like, we feel you're freaking out here. We're coming back to tell you it's gray or whatever. Really being able to release that and get into what I almost find is like a childish state of mind. And I, yeah. it, 
it seems bad to say, oh, you're such a child. Like you're no, pretending right. it's like that. But that's really the key and maybe why kids are so good at everything because they don't take it so seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Pretend. That's where we start to imagine. Let yourself have a little bit of an overactive imagination. Mm -hmm. Can you see the fairies? Mm -hmm. At first, you got to pretend. You got to have a sense of imagination and pretend. So I would walk around as a kid and say, if I was a gnome, where would I live? And I would make believe the power of make believe, the power of imagination, the power of pretend. Mm -hmm. And I would walk along and imagine, oh, I would live in that really cool thicket where there's a chain link fence in case there was a cat. I could go back and forth between the chain links and the cat mm. would have to hop over and I would have time to escape. Yeah. Mm. This is where as an adult, we often are too busy, don't have time running around, consternated mm -hmm. with whatever. So this is what we can challenge ourselves to do. Have a little fun again. It's worth yeah. it. For the colors that you see less or don't really resonate with as much, what are some of your personal correspondences to those types of colors? Like how yeah, do they I mean, change? I think I follow the regular correspondences because they're written out for us. So if I'm going to do a candle spell myself, mm -hmm. I will tend to use gold instead of green mm -hmm. or like a money or a prosperity spell. I'll often like gold leaf a um, beeswax candle myself, mm -hmm. or I'll use gold or I'll use yellow if I want like love or to fire up my love life or my sex life or something like that, I would use a red candle and maybe that would also be a red orange candle. And if I was doing a spell for someone else, which I don't do that for other people, if you want that, go to Madame Pamita. She's amazing. I would use a color design based on their correspondence. But if it was for me, if I was doing a self-love spell, yeah. I would probably use a purple candle because I personally resonate with that color and it would be about me. Oh, I'm an Aries. So I might use a red candle as a support candle just because someone told me it was red and I feel like that would be an Aries candle. Sure. Um, but it isn't really like the, it's funny. I would shy away from the red and green candles since they don't super resonate for me since I don't really see that like vibrant green. Yeah. Or I would coat a green candle in like gold glitter or blue or purple glitter or something that I could mm, see. Sure. I see. Yeah. So they're more like supporting characters. Yeah. yeah. I have a beautiful boy cozy, a beautiful poncho with a hood and it's green and purple. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that I love it is because of the purple and the green and it's an earthy green. But mm -hmm. that ends up being a very neutral color for me. And the purple really pops out of it. Ah. And without that purple, I probably would never wear it. That is really cool. And so just to wrap up all of this, what would you say are the biggest benefits of having this color deficiency? Embracing myself just as I am. I was pretend mad about being colorblind. I was behind a car with lots of bumper stickers on it about social justice. And I was like, what if I was pretend mad about colorblindness? And so I made a bunch of bumper stickers that were like, colorblindness is not blindness. Be kind right. to the colorblind. And so we have a link to those if you want to see them. Maybe one day we'll sell them. It'd be funny. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, comment so, below with which one's your favorite. Maybe we'll yeah, get it printed up. Yeah, Totally. So those are hilarious. Being able to embrace colorblindness as a gift. And it really is. It's a way of seeing the world just differently. And that I am able to have an incredible amount of joy seeing just the colors that I see. I have an example of a rainbow flag that I matched to the colors of the rainbow. And it gives me just as much joy as the regular rainbow because they look the same. So people will have a reaction and they'll say, oh, that's how you see the rainbow. And I'm like, no, like seeing these mm -hmm. different shades of like yellow and different shades of blue actually give me like so much happiness. That's all I need. It's hard to explain how those colors make me just as happy as the real rainbow because they're the same. Mm -hmm. And it's not that the rainbow is diminished. 
So it's not a deficiency. Instead, it's almost like we see so many more colors or Mm. our mind fills in all the colors that are missing and more. Yeah. Or something else is happening because we can find so much joy in the colors we do see. Mm. There's something amazing that's happening. It's hard to describe because I don't know, looking at that rainbow flag that has just the blues and the yellows and knowing that it makes me happy. And when I show it to other colorblind people, they're like, oh yeah, the rainbow flag, that's so awesome. (laughs) Of course, yes, I know. And it doesn't make any other colorblind person sad. It makes them happy. The only people that it makes sad is the color seeing people. Mm. There's something really interesting about that, that the only people who feel that we are deficient are the people who see color. So Mm -hmm. I think there's something deeper to think about with that. Yeah, great point. I don't know what that means. There's a listener out there who is going to come up with what that really means or say a response to that. And I want to know what your response is. Thanks for asking me about it. This was fun. Yeah, and I hope it's inspired other folks. Let's not pity people who just see things differently than us. It's just like everybody who has a different life. And so it just is what it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're totally fine. Stop messing with us. Yeah, that's right. Jim, thank you for sharing again. And if you have any thoughts or comments, please share them in the comment section on our YouTube. Or if you're listening to our podcast, you can always drop us an email at knitaspellpodcast at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you as always. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And we'll see you next week for our last episode of the season. Ah! Already? Oh my gosh. Time flies when you're having fun. It's been a colorful autumn. It sure has. Yes. (laughs) All right, everyone. With that, we will see you next week. Bye. Thanks for listening. listening. If you enjoyed the show, consider sharing it with a friend, leaving a review on iTunes and Spotify, or following Knit a Spell on Instagram. You can also subscribe to the Light from Lantern YouTube channel to enjoy full episodes of Knit a Spell and see our happy faces. You can also learn more about readings, classes, and events going on with your favorite maker of magic, James Devine, by visiting thedivinehand.com and subscribing to his newsletter. Then follow Jim's fun and interactive Instagram account at Divine Hand Jim. Keep up with Katie, the magical maker, by subscribing to her newsletter at lightfromlantern.com. You'll receive a free knitting pattern as a thank you gift. Then follow Katie on Instagram at lightfromlantern for even more magical making tips. See you See next, you next week. week.